So now that the Lego Movie 2, the second part, is out, I, I really wanted to do a video about the live-action framing device. Because I really love these movies, but that's the element that interests me the most, and how it recontextualizes the entire story as a metaphorical projection of a child's imagination. And the difficult thing about this sequel is that, in this movie, the real world is no longer a surprise, because we see it right from the beginning. So right from the beginning, I think everyone knows not to take everything in this story at face value. I feel like this is even alluded to a little bit within the movie, given the fact that Emmett is convinced that Rex is a projection of his own insecurities, almost as if he's anticipating the next big twist that this series is gonna throw at the audience. So you can see him? Oh, I was so worried he was just a projection of what my ego needs deep down, but no, he's real. Cool! So the first movie established, okay, everything in this world is being imagined by this child, Finn, and the dad is very particular about his Lego set being, like, perfectly glued into place, everything's fixed, everything has its place. But his son wants there to be a little bit more experimentation to it, and the father realizes how his son views him as basically this, this evil dictator, and they come to a beautiful resolution with each other. But of course now, memorably, at the very end of the film, the dad tells Finn that now that he gets to play down here with the Legos, you know who else gets to? Your sister. What? So we had the first movie that established, okay, nothing's fixed, we can let all perspectives be valid, there isn't just one singular special, everyone is the special, and everyone's imagination should be allowed to run wild. So how does the second movie build off of those conclusions, and I promise that was an unintentional pun? Well, it asks, in a constant state of malleability, what becomes of the sense of self? Where's the consistency? How do you be yourself if you're always changing, if you're growing up? What's wrong with you? You're not acting like yourself. And that's a really fascinating question. I think it's very important that this movie establishes that Finn isn't just a hypocrite right off the bat. He's not just following straight in the footsteps of his father. He's open to his sister, whose name we find out in this film is Bianca. He's open to her joining him in playtime, as represented by Emmett offering her the heart at the start of the film. In addition to a speech that is very reminiscent of the iconic one that Emmett gave at the end of the first film. But unfortunately, the conflict isn't resolved that simply. I suppose it's more difficult for someone to see eye to eye with you when they look up to you, as we later find out that Bianca very much does to Finn. So as five years have passed, Finn has taken his society of Bricksburg and turned it post-apocalyptic. He's given way to an edgy facade of teenage maturity, complete with brooding and battle armor and sewer babies, everything you could think of. Even Batman, who grew to accept friends and family in his solo outing, the Lego Batman movie, tragically regresses from that point because it's what the fans want for him to be seen as a brooding loner. But based on his tone when he says this, it sure doesn't seem like that's what he wants to be. <laughs> Not a terse laugh. Much in the way that Emmett, and by extension Finn, are forced into a quote-unquote darker, more mature version of themselves. Even the bright Unikitty seems to have settled permanently into her fiery, angry counterpart at the outset of the film. So amidst what is presumably the upteenth battle between Finn and Bianca, one of Bianca's adorable little talking hearts gets stuck in the door of Finn's creation's hideout. And Emmett, moved by its cuteness, decides to open the door for it, which we can take to represent Finn being guilted by his sister Bianca into letting her play with him. At the time, we're meant to think this is a moment of weakness for Emmett, him being too soft, directly resulting in his friends being taken to the Sistar system. But this is the rare inciting incident that actually ends up being a good thing, a positive sign of the willingness of Finn to let Bianca into his heart. And it's a moment that's directly called back to later in the film, when Lucy is moved to action by another cute and helpless stare from a representation of Bianca, finally bringing her to a certain level of optimism and trust, just as Emmett's about to fall out of it. And although Bianca wears a lot of her bright personality on her sleeve, she knows that her brother isn't going to be won over by her cutesy rainbow-colored ways alone. So she puts her Lego friends doll into a more sleek and intimidating spacesuit, thereby creating general mayhem. And as we hear later straight from this character's mouth, it's the only way Finn would have understood. Wearing a mask and talking tough, a language that she thought Finn would understand. But in reality, Finn's own perception of toughness seems to come from an interesting source. But what made Finn start to talk tough? He's given way to an edgy facade of teenage maturity, but what prompted this change? I mean, sure, he's putting together a post-apocalyptic wasteland world, but he's still making it out of Legos, come on. What's pushing him in this brooding direction? Well, the movie seems to partially suggest that Lucy has something to do with it, because very much within the context of the world of the Legos, Lucy is the one who's telling Emmett that he shouldn't just keep being optimistic all the time, that everything isn't awesome, and that she wants to see him grow up a little bit, adjust to the bleakness of the situation that they find themselves in. But who does Lucy represent in the real world? 
Well, actually, we kind of now know this pretty much for a fact. Chris Miller confirmed a fan theory on Twitter is pretty close to what they imagined, and that fan theory is that Lucy is based on a girl from Finn's class that he has a crush on. And she originally had a boyfriend with a Batman lunch bag or shirt or backpack or something, hence why he imagines Lucy with Batman himself as her boyfriend in the first film. And he didn't originally know her real name, hence why he gave Lucy the nickname Wildstyle at first, but eventually grew closer to her and learned more about her. So is Lucy's real-life counterpart functioning in a similar way, encouraging Finn to grow up a little bit more? Well, Finn's influence could be her, and or it could be something that the Lego movies have always been seeped in. Pop. Culture. Pop culture that provides a window into the world Finn hopes to enter. A fantasy of what he could have that allows him to recede into his own brain of self-important thoughts. That separates him from the sister he does have, and the reality of her separate vision. Finn's trying to be more mature and mindful of the real world, but he's rejecting reality and going further into his imagination to do it. Yes, he has a sister in the real world, but he never wanted a sister, and pop culture can help him make up for that. Teach me to be like you, someone Lucy will be proud of, and I'll be the brother you never had! Rex Danger Vest is very clearly an amalgamation of different Chris Pratt roles. Whether they be ones he actually played, like Peter Quill, or the ones people talked about him playing, like Indiana Jones in a reboot of the franchise. All of these Chris Pratt roles come from the interim between LEGO movies, aka real examples of modern male action heroes. Heroes that set the bar for a growing Finn's ideals for a strong male role model. But the film posits the question, are they really the best role models? Yes, of course, we can't forget how Star-Lord ruined everything in Infinity War. Beat it, Star-Lord. You got everyone killed. No one likes you anymore. But moreover, they're also a little emotionally closed off, and they don't have stable relationships. So how is that you leaving me? Because I left. I left you. They very much feel the need to assert their toughness. Just look at how jealous Peter became the second Thor entered the Pixar and Avengers Infinity War. As if Thor presented a challenge to Peter's manliness. He's trying to copy me. Enough! To this is very clearly paralleled by the film's inclusion of a very much real pop culture icon, Batman, of course. Especially through the song Gotham City Guys, in which it's thoroughly discussed how Batman is not an ideal soulmate. Not only because he's dark and brooding, but also because he's a playboy that'll never settle down. It's specifically stated that other superheroes are stronger because they're not afraid of commitment and relationships. But aren't Batman and Rex Danger Vest more mature and adult? Well, let's delve a little deeper into Rex's master breaker philosophy. He specifically refers to abandonment, abandonment regret, regret, and anger, anger as grown-up feelings, when in actuality, they're grown-up feelings in the sense that you feel them more when you start to grow up. But feeling them does not make you grown-up. When you're a uh, middle schooler, like, you perform this idea of, like, what a grown-up is supposed to act like, and you're supposed to be above it all, and you're basically just protecting yourself from vulnerability. So how do you grow up? This is something Emmett's very much concerned with. Not just whether he has the capacity to change, change is accepted as inevitable. As Emmett's dream of his ideal future shows us, he wants Lucy not just to see that he's changed, but to specifically see that he's changed perfectly. You've changed perfectly. Adapting to what life has thrown at them accordingly. We see Queen whatever a wanna be do this plenty. The first time we meet her, she's changed into a horse for a meeting with the animal planet of Anthropomorphia. She directly concerns herself with changing what she looks like on the outside in order to become the most appealing form in the eyes of others. And that's exactly what Emmett wants to do for Lucy, be a version of himself that she wants to see. As such, analogs of both Finn and Bianca are simultaneously altering representations of their appearance in a bid for more respect. My own Rex vest! Did you draw stubble dots on your face? What? No. What are you hiding? You're the one with the reflective mask. I tried to wear a mask and talk tough, a language I thought you'd understand and it totally did not work. The film's really all about what we should become. How much of us has to change? As Emmett says, alluding to both the fact that he's seen the big picture of the real world and the general idea of growing up. You can't ever go back to the person you used to be. Even though it was so much simpler, you have to find your own way. But you just don't know how. Just trace the word change throughout the film to get a sense of how integral the concept is. Life's impermanent, always changing. You can't hang on to the past. Otherwise, we might as well all be craggled. Crazy glued together like Lord Business and Finn's father wanted. So shouldn't Finn want the exact opposite? Meanwhile, Lucy warns of the Sistar System's plans, not because they're trying to destroy them or even hurt them, it's because, as she says, they're trying to change them. And she wants to protect her own identity. Don't you see? They are trying to change us. 
Queen would ever want to be, as I already stated, is a lot more liberal about her appearance. People change. I change like every five seconds. Like this. Boom. Oh. <laughs> commenting on her constant adapting with such a sense of certainty, but it's not so easy to accept for everyone else. As I said, when Emmett dreams of saving the day, his ideal for his own future, it's not just that he proves himself capable of change, it's that Lucy tells him that he's changed perfectly. Perfectly rising to the task of the specific situation presented in front of them. Perfectly adapting. So how much of yourself do you change? Are you like Sweet Mayhem posing as General Mayhem? And Emmett posing as Rex and Lucy posing as Wildstyle? Trying to wear a mask and talking tough? A language you think that the seemingly more mature people around you will understand? Fully putting away childish things? It's time to put away childish things. Or, do you find a way to meet someone in the middle? Well, as the end credits song goes... We've got to start playing in time Can there be a marriage of minds? Can we be alike? Yes, a marriage of Finn and Bianca's minds is what Finn's toy Batman and Bianca's toy whatever wanna be being married is meant to represent. And for these two kids in a quarrel, despite what our Lego heroes might think at first, that kind of gesture isn't motivated by one kid trying to bribe and subdue the other, shoving them in any semblance of their free will into a metaphorical storage bin forever. And it's not about one mind brainwashing another, trapping it under its control. The beautiful thing about a marriage of minds is that it offers a compromise. You can take into account the point of view of someone else without losing any of what makes you yourself. It's a peaceful union, not a hostile takeover. For years we've tried to join you, to play with you, but you've always pushed us away. Now all of our fighting has brought us to the brink of Armageddon. But this wedding can change all that. Bring us together and stop Armageddon. The lyrics continue to describe how the differences between Finn and Bianca actually bring them together. Finn and Bianca are all that the other is not, better as a two, and even though they're different, they're the same. And the first, second, and Batman Lego movies all actually have a similar, albeit different lyric about being similar, albeit different. We're the same, I'm like you, you love me. We are both the same, though we both have different names. Even though we're different, we're the same. The benefits of partnership really are at the core of the film, even on a behind the scenes level. Original LEGO Movie writer-directors and LEGO Movie 2 writers, Phil Lord and Chris Miller, professed to circling around a lot of similar themes in their films. Positivity, inclusivity, and working together. But it was a Fandango interview that pointed out that the LEGO Movie 2 is kind of like their most personal film as a writing couple. Since, as Phil Lord puts it, it's about what it takes to combine two points of view and two imaginations, and how one and one can make three. And how challenging that is, and how hard it is to accommodate two different points of view but also how enriching that can be. Yeah, you thought it was meta before, being a story about people with multiple perspectives from two people who have two perspectives on how to tell a story, but it was actually a story from two people who have two perspectives on how to tell a story about two people who have two perspectives on how to tell a story about people with multiple perspectives. I don't even understand what you're saying! Don't worry, you don't have to. And the funny thing about learning to work with someone else is that it doesn't dilute your sense of self, it's just the opposite. It lets you become more comfortable in your own skin because it prompts you to bring what you have to the table, aware of the fact that you're all that the other person is not, and there's nothing to be ashamed about or hide about yourself. We all know that Lucy repressed her true name from the first film, and still does to the point that five years later, her other friends still seem to call her wild style, but apparently there was even more she was hiding, whether it's literally coloring over the light blue streaks in her hair, or hiding the fact that she was in fact an original singer of Everything Is Awesome. No wonder she has such a personal resentment to that song, yet was able to sing it so well as a cover to the robots in the first movie. Everything is awesome. Man, Finn really thought this all through, didn't he? And if there was still any doubt in his long-term planning skills, listen closely to a scuffle between him and Bianca early into this film. I'm in the middle of a storyline with time travel and mind-blowing twists. These guys. Yes, like many of us, when Finn got older, he got to see a classic movie older kids get to watch, Back to the Future, and it clearly blew his mind and left an impact on him. It's a classic movie older kids get to watch. Yet another sign that Finn is growing and changing, being exposed to new things, and that things aren't staying the same, literally glued into place. Both Finn and Bianca's imaginations are running wild in beautifully separate ways. While Finn is coming up with his convoluted time travel storyline that doesn't really need to make sense, this time travel stuff's always kind of confusing. It's best just to go with it. Seriously, did Finn actually lose Emmett for that long underneath the dryer, or what, what was going on? Or when you have Bianca straying from the standard Lego brand, including Duplo and Lego Friends. 
We wanted to make sure that her interests were really diverse. You'll notice there's fabric as there's well as There's stickers, pipe cleaners, glitter, um, paper cutouts. So it's a real mixed media world up, up in the Sistar system. Heck, she doesn't mind playing with three different Wonder Woman figures in the same universe at once. To quote head of story Trissa Gum, we figure there are no rules since this story features a younger sister's Lego world. She doesn't care if there are three Wonder Woman. I guess it's just all the more awesome. This is a very different vision from Finn. It also doesn't help that Finn is of course used to having to claim his right to the Legos, having dealt with his father's brainwashing Lord business last time. It's no wonder that he has Rex jump to the conclusion that everyone in the Sistar system has become brainwashed. They've all become cheery, non-questioning members of a utopian society. Something must be wrong, right? The filmmakers even find a way to parallel the fact that Emmett has seen the real world. My time alone was an awakening. I learned how the universe really works. With the fact that Finn is having to grow older and go out and face the real world. Not only does this movie take us outside in the live action world for the first time, Rex yells that none of it is even happening. It's all just the expression of the death of imagination in the subconscious of an adolescent. And all of his friends that he's been playing with are just plastic. You still want to go back to the Matrix when you know the truth? Rex and Emmett really represent a battle for Finn's soul. Who he's going to grow up to be. Will he compassionately continue to build meaningful connections? It's easy to harden your heart, but to open it, that's the toughest thing you can do. I'm going to grow up but I won't stop caring about the people in my life. And they may see the world differently, but that's not bad. I think it's inspiring. Or will he break off ties with the people in his life, dismissing them as childish, brainwashed, and, well, as stiff as plastic? You don't have friends. They're just pieces of plastic. <laughs> and much in the way that the first film showed off master building, and this one gives us master breaking, the plot of the sequel really functions as a sort of inverse of the original. Whereas at first, Emmett had to confront the fact that his world was more dastardly and cynical than he had originally perceived, this time, his own put-upon cynicism threatens to bring down everyone else, as represented by Finn breaking Bianca's creations. In the first film, Emmett told Lord Business that he didn't have to be the bad guy, and lent him a hand. It's my hand. I want you to take it. You don't have to be the bad guy. This time, future Emmett is told that he doesn't have to become the bad guy, and vanishes, physically unable to take a hand. You don't have to be the bad guy. Come on, take our hand while you still have a hand to take. That ain't how it works, kid. Yeah, everything's not always awesome. Really, in the end, the Lego Movie 2's all about finding the balance between embracing change and being yourself. In a world where Lord Business's attempt to freeze everything perfectly in place was stopped, and alternative viewpoints are invited to play along, the door has really been opened for change to be embraced. As Rex Dangervest puts it, otherwise we might as well all be craggled. Yet curiously, although the apocalypse has drastically changed pretty much everyone in this society, our hero Emmett is the one exception. Despite all that he's seen and conquered, he still retains the cheery disposition that makes him him, right down to his morning routine of overpaying at the coffee shop and jamming out to everything is awesome. What's so fascinating about Emmett's outlook on life is that despite the fact he lived in a brainwashed capitalistic nightmare, he took the projected ideals of his world and transformed them into his unironic reality. For Emmett, everything really is awesome, and everyone is the prophesied special because everyone in the community is awesome and has their own role to play. Everything is better when they stick together, not because they should literally be stuck together, but because teamwork is important. Emmett's so convinced in the inherent good of people that he even temporarily sidesteps the Act 3 conflict between our protagonist trope, out of sheer trust in Lucy, in spite of Rex's warnings. And even when he does come to distrust her in the climax, it's only because he thinks that the real, not brainwashed Lucy would never have kept a secret from him. But what Lucy can't understand about Emmett is how he can act like everything is awesome when it isn't. And as she ultimately learns and expresses via her own updated song, everything's not awesome but you have to believe in your heart that you can make everything awesome, in a less idealistic kind of way. Everything's not awesome, but we can make it a little more awesome if we remember we're not alone in this world. We're in it together. And when we see Lucy join Emmett on his morning routine in the end of the film, we see that she's taken this lesson to heart and is in fact approaching life more optimistically keeping her light blue streaks and embracing her musical past, admitting part of her still likes that music. You really know it's a movie about identity when the antagonist's goal is to simply guarantee his own existence. Yeah, Rex is going to literally vanish if he doesn't ensure that Emmett becomes him. 
And of course, Queen Whatever Wanna Be symbolizes the limitless potential of one's identity, being able to morph at will into any conceivable form or shape. Is there any sense of self at that point? Or is it just an unrecognizable mismatch? Well, as we eventually discover, every brick that made her came straight from the heart Emmett presented to Bianca at the beginning of the film. And when he gave it to her, he said, It can be whatever you want it to be. Showing that no matter what she becomes, her roots can always be traced back to the loving relationship Finn and Bianca share. And that this loving relationship will be a constant for these siblings as they continue to grow up together in this crazy changing world, no matter what they become. It's the credits. Yeah, that's the best part. When the essay ends and the reading starts, I'm satirizing what's already satire. It's a super ultra mega meta multiplier. It's so self-indulgent you'll wanna leave. But to think you're still here is quite naive. This'll get 200 views and maybe 20 likes. So enjoy before it hits 11 copyright strikes.